Awesome. There we go. Uh, with all that said, this is going to be a really incomplete history. The goal is not about it being like objective or comprehensive. Um, but yeah, just actually hearing from these four amazing people uh, and what they have to share. And so with that said also, this is the hope is that there are more of these. And so if you want to help, if you have ideas about panelists, uh, you could email you could email me, Elliot at rogueactioncenter.org. I'm thinking we'll do another one in August. Um, and that and yeah, and also that by history, part of what I mean is amazing dance parties and like high schoolers organizing and things that happened this week, as well as things that have happened like in the past thousands of years. So, so this is also history, what's happening today. Um, and finally, before we start, I want to acknowledge that while we're meeting in digital space, we're also all in particular places and on indigenous land. I'm joining from my home, uh, which is in Tequilma in the Illinois River Valley, which is on Tequilma land. Tequilma people have lived here for over 10,000 years. And from the late 1840s to about 1857, both the state of Oregon and the US government carried out genocide, ethnic cleansing, and the forced removal of the Tacoma people as a way to acquire land. Um, the Tacoma people were promised peace, safety, and a permanent reservation, and those promises haven't been fulfilled. So uh, just making some space to recognize that this is still indigenous land and we honor the lives of all who endured and continue to endure in the face of systemic oppression and settler colonialism. And I am sure I did that imperfectly um, and I'm open to learning and I'm just learning. Um, with that said, I wanna say a thank you to the people who've helped to bring this up together. Lisa Norton, Many Smiles, Michelle Glass, Matthew Reynolds, uh, Lori Warfield, Brooke Colley, Lycan Koss, Claire Harcola, Rory Meza, Rebecca. Um, thanks for all the conversations that helped bring us here. And with that, I wanna pass it to our panelists to introduce themselves and speak about their work. Um, so each person will have about 15 minutes to talk about their role in um, their role in history. And then we'll take a break at roughly 7 p.m. And then we'll come back and open it up. So uh, with that, I'll pass it to you, Robert. Thanks, Elliot. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Kenta, and I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. And I have worked for my tribe in cultural resources protection for just about 30 years. And also the last uh, 16 plus of those years now, I've also served on elected government for my tribe. Uh, my family comes from the Applegate River Valley. They're in the kind of a sub valley of the Rogue Valley, larger geographic area. Uh, Rogue Valley, um, Upper Klamath River and Scott River areas of Northern California. And uh, as was just stated, our families were rounded up and marched here to the Siletz Reservation about 1856. Um, my great-grandfather was an orphan boy. Both of his parents had been killed during the Rogue River Wars. So our family has been here at Siletz Reservation ever since. And I live uh, on what used to be reservation land. Um, all of our land got moved out of Indian ownership by the 1950s. And uh, so we still live on our land, but it's not considered technically reservation um, currently. So a lot of history in there. And I uh, just wanna to acknowledge too, as Elliot was saying, all of our queer ancestors on all sides of our um, genealogies. Um, I'm half Finn almost a quarter Indian German Irish mix as far as I know. And um, so all of our uh, ancestries have that queer indigenous history to wherever they're from. And there's been a lot of impacts to those histories over time by other ideologies moving in and telling us what to think, what to say, what language to say it in and, and all of those things. So um, to talk about our queer indigenous history, 
the term two spirit is uh, most often in use when speaking about it in English language. And it's an English language term that Indian country has adopted to kind of envelop and incorporate all of the tribal traditional terms for two spirit people. And in my Shasta language, um, it is something like Gittak Owahi. And Gittak is a time uh, morning and night when it's not quite in the morning, it's not quite daylight, but it's not totally dark yet either. So it's a between time. And then again in the evening when the sun is setting, it's not quite nighttime yet, but it's a pretty diminished light. So in Shasta language, that was a term just noting that we are not male or female exclusively. Um, we're a blend of those things or something maybe completely separate from male and female. Everybody has their own thoughts on where we land on that spectrum. So in tribal society, um, generally there wasn't exclusion of people who are different. And uh, mostly that has continued into the current times. And as traditional societies, we had to um, recognize all of our gifts that our people in our community had. Everybody had to live together, work together, and there was a lot of respect for individuality and some recognition of differences in people um, being an extra gift, that there was power in those things. And so our queer people, we have different perspectives on the world, how to look at things. And because of that, in traditional societies, a lot of times we have ceremonial roles and doctoring, healing uh, practices and um, mediation, being go-betweens between disputing parties, all of those kinds of things. And uh, male-bodied two-spirit people would often be, um, they would either float back and forth between male and female attire or live their lives basically dressed as uh, female and uh, doing mostly women's work or a blend of those things, maybe shifting back and forth throughout the day or, or from year to year. So our people had a lot of um, ability to be fluid in their gender expression, their sexuality. Um, and, you know, today we would most likely, um, well, things are shifting all the time, but, um, you know, if we see two male-bodied uh, people in a relationship that are intimate with each other, oh, there's a gay couple. But in Indian society, very often a uh, straight man might have two or three female wives and a two-spirit wife, and that would bring um, prosperity and and good luck and a lot of hard work <laughs> into that household, a lot of productivity, a lot of talents and gifts. And so that husband of those several people wouldn't be considered, oh, he's gay because he has a two-spirit husband. It's just natural for um, people to be accepting of all different kinds of relationships. Uh, so similarly, female, Female body two spirit um, often would be warrior women, women who um, uh, often didn't marry and have children of their own, um, maybe engaged in other uh, mostly male identified activities of hunting and fishing and, and things that uh, uh, women generally didn't do. And uh, so there, there's, a lot, of a lot of people look at Indian communities and think of gender roles, but um, those are, things aren't rigid in our tribal communities. There's ability to uh, be flexible and, and uh, recognize an individual spirit. And that's why we say two spirit. Um, there's lots, lots of examples through history. Most of what is known about Shasta language was gathered um, from a two-spirit Shasta male-bodied person uh, who lived on the upper Klamath River 
into the 1950s. I think he passed away just before 1960, if I remember right. And his name was Sergeant Sambo. And he is the one that gave that term, uh, Geto Kawahi, is how he was referred to by his people on the Upper Klamath River. Uh, other two spirits have been uh, documented in Western Oregon throughout time. Um, in Kalapuya text written by Melville Jacobs, there's a, a, an account, not by a two-spirit person, but referring to somebody who had passed years before. And they said that he lived with a man and that man was called his husband. So even during reservation times, um, and probably even after the Catholic Church was assigned to the Grand Round Reservation, where most of the Kalapuya people were, um, there was... Um, probably some frowns from the Catholic Church on that relationship, but uh, you know that relationship is still was still in memory of the people of the Grand Round community, and uh, and the the one that they were talking about, not the husband, uh, was a traditional doctor, very well respected during reservation times at Grand Round. And among our lower Umpqua people too, there's a story very similar that a very well-known doctor took the prettiest boy as his husband and even paid um, a bride price for that younger, very good looking male. And so that story actually takes, um, takes place right around uh, early reservation times. And it kind of notes some of the um, biases that were coming into our culture uh, from the outside influence of uh, Christianity and just kind of mainstream white society at the time. And they, because they said that um, a bride price was paid, but the family really didn't want to let that boy go to that Indian doctor. Um, but there's a lot of um, kind of reading between the lines. I don't think the relationship would have happened uh, they wouldn't have uh, accepted the bride price if it wasn't um, something that the, the two people wanted themselves. So, um, so two-spirit terminology is really um, our, it really notes a traditional role that people are living in the community, fulfilling that traditional role and for a couple of generations, a lot of our um, tribal people with same-sex attractions didn't get the education about the availability or the existence of that uh, traditional role for them, uh, especially as a Christian denomination uh, missionary work made inroads into the reservation communities. People feel, felt like they didn't have a place in their own community. So a lot of pe tribal people moved to the cities and uh, went into mainstream kind of gay life and culture. Um, but that's not fulfilling that traditional role. And being gay and native is part of the same thing, but, um, uh, and it's not, not always, you know, people's fault that they um, didn't know about those things growing up, didn't step into that traditional role. Maybe, maybe if, even if they knew about it, they wouldn't choose to step into that role. They are drawn to the city and that's where their future life belongs. But um, uh, that's where they would find the most happiness maybe. Uh, but we have to do a lot more efforts in our native communities to um, make our young people growing up more accepting of each other and of themselves so that they know that they have that opportunity to have a place in their own home community. Uh, so Sergeant Sambo was one and he mostly dressed uh, male. Um, at, at an, I apologize if we have Klamath tribal members on the, on the uh, meeting tonight and I misspeak, so correct me if I misspeak, but I've had Klamath uh, members talk to me about White Cindy and I know she was written about a lot, a male body two-spirit from Klamath Lake country, uh, from the Klamath reservation, and was a traditional doctor. And even all the white folks around uh, Klamath Falls knew her. She dressed as a woman daily, nightly, 
and conducted her doctoring work. I think did midwifery and dream interpretation work, all kinds of thing and things in her uh, tribal community. Very well known. And I think there's actually a group of photographs of White Cindy at University of Oregon that I never have had a chance to look up. Uh, but even I, I heard at one time that one of the treaty signers uh, from 1864, uh, Klamath Treaty, was two spirit early in life and um, had male relationships and at a certain point went away from that and went on to be a married man with children and a chief of his tribe who signs 1864 treaty. So that, that again kind of reflects that ability for um, there to be fluidity in, uh, in identity of all kinds. Cut me off if I go over time. <laughs> um, so our um, that traditional role, it's um, our two-spirit community really um, emphasizes that two-spirit identity is to be um, pretty exclusive to our native people, that there are other terms, other continents, other places, other cultures and languages, and um, uh, there's some strong feeling of uh, not wanting that two-spirit identity just to become international global um, reference point for, for queer identity, that it's something very specific in North and South Central America that uh, our people um, want to maintain that. So a lot of us are, of course, mixed culture. I've already uh, said I'm a half Finn, almost quarter Indian, so I'm a Finjan. And a lot of people consider that, uh, <laughs> you know, not uh, politically correct. Um, but all of us have those, uh, many of us anyway, have, have a lot of those mixed identities and affiliations. And, and so I'm learning more about my Finnish culture as well and uh, hope to make a trip there. I was supposed to be there in 2020, but that didn't happen. <laughs> um, there are two spirit gatherings of native people and their partners. If their partner's not native, a lot of times uh, those gatherings include them. Uh, there are ongoing tribal traditional ceremonies where two spirit people have uh, a traditional role and um, those could be of different kinds. I've heard in one Plains tribe that's two-spirit male-bodied people that go out and cut the center pole for the Sundance Arbor in uh, at least one on one res reservation. And that's been their tradition and, and continues to be. I know I've been at Sundance's um, other places. We don't, we don't have Sundance in our traditions, but uh, I've been invited to Sundance's and there are, uh, sweats specifically for two-spirit and uh, in our traditional roles here um, it's really about uh, taking care of people in your community um, and bridging between male and female issues in the community um, you know I've been openly gay I did since the uh, mid 1980s. And, um, you know, I was always encouraged growing up in things like basketry and language and, and things that most of the boys my age weren't showing interest in, and in, in oftentimes not even many of the girls. But I just felt a real strong connection to traditional culture and preserving of those things, even though I was the blondest blue eyed thing you ever saw. Um, my tribal community accepted me and they recognized that I had those interests and they encouraged them, even if it was mostly um, female interests um, is how those things would be perceived. But even very Christian people in our community that knew those traditional things, they shared things with me that were generally taught to girls as they saw my interest and saw somebody to pass those things along to. I think I must be nearing my time. Sure. I mean, it's true. I could listen to you all day, Robert. 
Um, <laughs> and to make sure there's some space for discussion, sure, if you want to wrap up and, and pass it to Daniel, um, that sounds great. Let's do that. Thank you. Okay. I'm waiting to be prompted. Am I oh yeah, Daniel, go for it. It's working. <laughs> we see you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Robert. Um, my name is Daniel Elash. I uh, went back to school in my 30s uh, after a long decade of activism and self-education. Uh, and despite my best efforts to become a Mediterraneanist, that doesn't really happen in America. So I took my master's degree in US history and ended up teaching it. So I don't know what kind of karma I'm working off, but here I am. Um, I kind of want to dive right in because uh, there's a lot to say in 15 minutes. And so I'm going to uh, also keep it kind of terse. Uh, and along those lines, the first thing I want to do is reference a book called Eden Within Eden, Oregon's Utopian Heritage by James J. Kopp, K-O-P-P. Uh, which goes over the long history uh, involved in the white colonization of Oregon. Um, one of the first things I do with uh, my students in some of my classes is go over the difference, not really the difference, but what is the difference between imperialism and uh, colonialism? Uh, and of course, uh, imperialism is the idea that one country or culture uh, goes and conquers another and uh, rules it remotely. A colony, on the other hand, is an imperial strategy whereby uh, a group of people is planted on the conquered soil and sort of uh, exercises control and more broadly social hegemony uh, as a resident population within the conquered land. And... Uh, the whole history of the Oregon Territory uh, was kind of determined when the United States, under the influence of the idea of manifest destiny, uh, which could be dug very deeply into, basically encouraged people to move to the Oregon Territory because at some point there was a vote of uh, at least the white people who were in the area of whether the Northwest Territory was going to be United States American or British. Um, and so the land grants to American settlers here were particularly generous because basically they were packing the vote for the territory to become American territory. And that did happen in the 1840s. Um, before that, the major Western power here was the Hudson Bay Company uh, doing fur trapping and trading stuff. Um, but after that, uh, the emphasis became on uh, American settlers from the East looking for farmlands and the homestead allotments to white Christian settlers were particularly generous uh, with the hopes of encouraging people to make the arduous trek here. Uh, and amongst those colonists were people who were specifically interested in founding what we would now call isolate communities uh, or groups of people uh, intentionally making a different culture than the one they came from. And the history of the American settling of the U.S. West is full of such uh, uh, efforts, uh, founding of intentional communities um, on the part of colonial pioneers. And uh, James Cobb's Eden with the Eden goes into quite a bit of that in the 19th century. So I kind of want to anchor it there. And fast forward a little bit. In uh, 1871, for several months, the citizens of Paris rose up and uh, declared an end of the rule of capital in an episode generally known as the Paris Commune. And out of that and other world events, uh, the first international was founded. Um, and basically, uh, what was going on that doesn't get talked about a lot in terms of like socialist history was industrialization and uh, its impacts on what it meant to be free uh, in a society, uh, what it meant to be a citizen. Where were your rights if you didn't have economic security? 
um, the United States was founded with the idea of the sort of farmer citizen going back to ancient Roman Republican ideals uh, that the so-called founding fathers were heavily steeped in due to uh, their educations and uh, the sort of model of Cincinnatus, the morally upright farmer who was called to duty when the Republic was threatened, went off and fought for it, but then refused political accolades or offices and went back to his modest farmstead and continued farming was an early ideal of the American Republic, which was rapidly disrupted by industrialization. If you leave your farm and you move into the city and you're dependent on somebody for a wage in exchange for your right to exist, where's your freedom? And of course, the socialist movement came to the United States in the course of its industrialization uh, and particularly informed by the end of the Civil War, the end of chattel slavery and the beginning of an era we call the, that of the robber barons, which seemed to be consigned to history until you know, roughly the turn of this century where we've seen it return. Um, and that first movement called itself socialist. And the basic argument there was whether it would be more effective to take over the government and use that to grab control of industry or whether it would be uh, more functional to seize industry and use that to take over government. But either way, the original socialist movement's idea was uh, that no private individual should own uh, massive industries uh, or what is sometimes called uh, the means of production. And that debate went on in a lively manner for some decades before at the end of World War I, the Russians overthrew their czar and declared a Soviet Republic. And that was where we got the term communism um, as we understand it today. But there were people in the socialist movement who didn't approve of or agree with uh, the Bolshevik idea of a socialist revolution and sort of became what we would call anti-communist socialists. And one of those groups was called the League for Industrial Democracy. And the League for Industrial Democracy was one of several what we would now call splinter groups or sects. Um, and it went on for some time. Uh, Norman Thomas famously sort of resuscitated the old Socialist Party in the 1950s because there were plenty of people around who were interested in communal living, but not interested in the Soviet model of revolution and revolutionary governance. And about 1960, you start seeing a new generation come into this movement, including uh, a sort of generation of idealistic young people. Some of them were red diaper babies. Some of them were just smart and attracted to questions of social change. Um, and they ended up in this League for Industrial Democracy because they got recruited to it in their college. Um, the League for Industrial Democracy was a sort of student arm of an anti-communist socialist group, but not all of those students were anti-communist. And so you see the rise of the anti-anti-communist uh, progressive left-wing socialist-minded student. Uh, at some point they broke off and they founded an organization called the Students for a Democratic Society. Uh, which may ring a bell. Uh, there's uh, a wonderfully detailed Wikipedia page on the Students for a Democratic Society. You might check it out. It is an introduction to what is called the New Left. Um, it was a component piece. I mean, there were other pieces of the New Left, particularly uh, emerging notions of Black Power, uh, the Chicano movement, uh, the American Indian movement, uh, all that stuff kind of came out of the 60s and the great meeting ground for a bunch of these different uh, culturally specific liberation movements was resistance to the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War weighed heavily on the students for a democratic society because these were middle class white kids who were going to get drafted and sent to Vietnam and they didn't want to go. But not all of them were primarily focused on the war. Um, there was an argument early on in the SDS uh, between campus organizing uh, and 
students, relatively privileged, relatively middle class, mostly white students, kind of discovered that their schools were sitting in or near ghettos. Um, and they kind of started going out into the community and talking about how would we even approach organizing with these people. And there was a, a faction or an element of the SDS uh, that founded something called the Economic Research and Action Program, or ERAP. And they got involved in uh, interracial organizing of poor communities. They decided that's where if they centered their efforts, they would most likely build the kind of social change that could lead to a revolution of some sort uh, in the United States. And important to that particular faction, ERAP, was a fellow named Tom Hayden, uh, who you may have heard of. He was uh, involved in 60s radicalism and then later in his career became a state senator from California for some time, a progressive leftist politician. And he and a young man named Carl Whitman uh, found themselves working together on ERAP in Newark, New Jersey, which uh, was burned to the ground by its angry citizens in 1967 as part of the general uh, uh, racialized uprising in the sort of urban core ghettos late in what we call the civil rights movement. Um, and this Carl Whitman, it turns out, was a gay boy. Uh, Carl Whitman, uh, his parents were sort of lefties, uh, teachers, uh, kind of loners in their community in that they were sort of comfortably upper middle class, but they were committed socialists, uh, not particularly anti-communist. And so Carl was what we might call a red diaper baby. That said, uh, when it came time for college, Carl got shipped off to Swarthmore, uh, a nice Ivy-ish private Quaker school in Pennsylvania where he fell in with SDS and got very involved, was a very loud proponent for ERAP and ended up in Newark, New Jersey, working with Tom Hayden and others. Um, I want to get deep into talking about leftist culture, but basically Carl was... Uh, enjoying the same sort of contradictory pressures any other gay person in the leftist movement at the time was under. And that pressure was to marry and have children and uh, participate in basically what we would now call heteronormativity. Um, but he didn't want to. He wanted to be a gay boy. And so he had some approach avoidance around that. Uh, and some of the sources I've read basically indicate that Carl was in love with Tom. And at some point, he expressed that to Tom. And Tom wasn't really very okay with that at all. Uh, in fact, he was cold and harsh and probably mean. And uh, Carl left the SDS with some disillusion. Uh, of course, by the early 70s, the SDS was falling apart into many component parts, many uh, uh, fragments and factions, one of the more famous being the Weather Underground who decided that the revolutionary moment had arrived and it was the duty of class conscious individuals to form armed resistance cells and start blowing things up. That didn't last long, but it burned pretty bright. Uh, another famous piece of that would have been the Prairie Fire Organizing Committee. Um, I want to suggest that Carl Whitman was a sort of fragment of the SDS uh, what happened with him was he ended up in Berkeley, uh, living an increasingly open gay lifestyle. Uh, in fact, uh, he had a regular boyfriend, but it was an open relationship. And he was running ads in the back of the Berkeley barb and turning tricks with guys for money. And at some point, he came up to Southern Oregon to check out the hippie commune scene. Now, part of why I talk about the communists early on is for this moment. In as early as the mid '60s, the uh, largely but certainly not exclusively white counterculture that we now call the hippies uh, sort of decided that modern society is corrupt and hopeless, and what we have to do is get back to the land and back to nature and make our lives more simple 
and in tune and in harmony with the earth. And in the course of doing that, we can build the new society in the shell of the old. And as different as the rhetoric was, gee, doesn't that mechanism look a lot like those 19th century pioneers thinking they were going to come found a Christian utopia in the backwoods of Oregon, recently stolen from its ancient inhabitants? Um, now, this movement coincided with something else that happened about that time that doesn't get enough attention historically, and that is the construction of the interstate highway system which the United States crash built in the 1950s and 60s, basically as a Cold War munition, as a way to move nuclear weapons around the country rapidly in the case of a Soviet invasion, that also happened to open up to uh, commercial and passenger traffic. It was sort of like the internet of its age. And what it did was made places that were formerly incredibly remote and difficult to get to and difficult to be in if you couldn't like hunt and fish, particularly because there, you know, weren't refrigerator trucks stocking stores running on electricity. Well, that highway came through and it opened up vast new territories that were otherwise relatively unspoiled by industry. And Southern Oregon was one of those places. Our section of the I-5 went in between about 1957 or eight and 1962 or three. And by 1965, you have some of the first hippie communes being founded in the area. I want to suggest there's a direct connection there. Um, and, you know, some of the more famous ones are the town of Tequilma, uh, which basically was a hippie commune town operating as much as it could without money. Uh, of course, that receded over time, but the school's still there. Uh, another major early big hippie commune in the area was a place called uh, the Mountain Grove Community which is just north of here. It's just outside of Glendale. And that land still exists. It's still held in trust. It drew a lot of people. It drew a lot of interest. There were other communes in the area as well. I could run down a list, but I'm trying to stay on story here. Uh, that particular commune attracted a couple of individuals uh, named Ruth and Jean, who were Quaker activists in the mid late 60s and when they went out to mountain grove they fell in love the hippies weren't real cool with it <laughs> not unlike tom hayden not really being that into carl feeling that way about him <clears throat> uh, the best that i can piece together uh carl whitman came up here at some point between 68 and 70 and fell in love with the idea but didn't really see it as necessarily viably very gay, at least as it existed. What else Carl Whitman did at that time was he wrote a manifesto. And that's the third thing I want to reference. Um, it is dated anywhere from 1968 to 1970, depending on the source. Uh, it was appearing in countercultural publications at the time. My guess is there were probably a couple iterations of it. Uh, I think the famous one was in a queer leftist paper called Red Butterfly, but it ran in other papers as well. And it was called Refugees from America, a Gay Manifesto. And I wanna read just a little bit of it to give you the sense of where it's going. He says, this, this copy is dated 1970. San Francisco is a refugee camp for homosexuals. We have fled here from every part of the nation and like refugees elsewhere, we came not because it is so great here, but because it was so bad there. By the tens of thousands, we fled small towns where to be ourselves would endanger our jobs and any hope of a decent life. We have fled from blackmailing cops, fired from jobs, beaten by punks and policemen. Oh, uh, we we fled from blackmailing cops, from families who disowned or tolerated us. We've been drummed out of the armed services, thrown out of schools, fired from jobs, beaten by punks and policemen. And we formed a ghetto out of self-protection. It is a ghetto rather than a free territory because it is still theirs. Straight cops patrol us. Straight legislators govern us. Straight employers keep us in line. Straight money exploits us. We have pretended everything is okay because we haven't been able to see how to change it. We've been afraid. I'm going to jump ahead quite a bit just to give you a flavor of this goes on it, it, it's almost endearing in a sort of primitive analysis. And you can see the SDS 
the ERAP kind of like structurally schematic analysis of the situation of the gay man. Uh, and hey, Daniel, relation- I wonder if you could like, uh, I, I could listen to you all night. And just in the in the interest of like hearing from other folks, like maybe connect that with, um, yeah, like just connect that with the radical fairies or wherever you kind of want to take it, and and so we could hear from the next person, knowing that we'll come back and and there will be more space for conversation. Okay, uh, to summarize. Uh, Whitman goes on to foresee the founding of intentional communities. And I think it's an obvious inspiration of the hippie communes that were happening here. By 1972, he bought a piece of land in Golden, Oregon, and started looking for people, to, gay people, queer people, men and women, uh, to come live on it with him and build a commune. Um, and he found some people. Uh, they ended up not living on his land, but buying land immediately next to it that in the course of the next couple of years, gender segregated and became the first of dozens of women's lands in Southern Oregon, a place called Cabbage Lane. Um, but originally that was sort of bifurcated. 60 acres of it was women only, 20 acres of it was men only. The situation was uncomfortable for everyone. And somebody named George Jalbert on the men's land, uh, in order to resolve the situation, bought a nearby farm from a local family who had it since homestead days and founded a gay men's commune there uh, that came to be known as Magdalen Farm. They moved in in 1976, and there were two or three generations of things that happened there. Uh, And then by the early mid 80s, gay men were busy dying of AIDS. And uh, George Jalbert moved back to San Francisco and became a nurse on Ward 5A at San Francisco General Hospital, the AIDS ward that really innovated uh, HIV healthcare at all stages. Um, And so who was left as caretaker of that was a person named Asunta Femia. Um, sometimes presenting male, sometimes presenting female, always aggressively ambivalent about it. But at length, Asunta was not able to maintain the farm. So Asunta went looking for somebody to save the farm. And what she found was a circle of gay men calling themselves radical fairies who had decided that they needed to buy their own land to conduct their own communal rituals on. Um, this particular group was calling it self nominous And it was led by another old queer communist named Harry Hay. There's a whole nother backstory about Harry Hay, but Harry Hay usually gets most of the ink. So I'm trying to focus on the fact that, in fact, the Nominus land did not come from Nominus. Nominus stepped in partway through the story of a much older uh, queer men's group. And that, in fact, the common thread is communism. Because Harry was an old communist, famously. And there's a whole story there I could tell you about him, but I'm not going to. Suffice to say that that transition happened in 1986, 7, and ever since, uh, Nominus has been running the Wolf Creek Radical Ferry Sanctuary. However, pretty much everything that gay men have done out here have been, has been innovated and uh, I know Pioneer is a, is a, tr- problematic word but basically the women came up with it all first they came up with publishing uh rural country living for queers magazines they came up with uh how to hold uh land in common without a single ownership a land trust the famous one is the oregon women's land trust um the owl farm uh they came up with gatherings and the men kind of followed suit uh, and part of why it's important to understand Carl Whitman is Carl Whitman was not anti-separatism. He felt like people should do whatever it was they felt like they needed to do to, be- to become free. And if women felt like they needed to take space and push men out of it, he was all for that. But he thought we were all stronger together. And so he continued to work with all communities. And his famous thing was square dancing. 
And his major innovation was instead of dividing a square dance group up by men and women, he did it by red shirts and green shirts. So anybody could pick whatever they want and do whatever role in the dance they wanted. And he really saw dance as a way to bring people together. But uh, I do want to point out that the common thread through all of this uh, really goes back to the idea of uh, a thing shared in common by all members of its community, as opposed to uh, a neighborhood of property owning citizens. And that that is actually the real distinction between the counterculture and the mainstream culture. And you can't really understand that. You don't really understand the socialist roots and particularly the communist roots of what happened out here, a lot of which has been lost in the shuffle of identity politics. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and thanks for taking it, taking it far back to bring us there. Um, I want to pass it to you, Gina. Thank you so much, Elliot. And thank you for having me here. And I just want to tell the panelists that this is awesome. I have been taking notes. I love the history. Can't wait to hear from you, Delane, and take us to another level. Um, just, I was going to bring it up a little bit more closer to the times that we are in now and the importance of Pride and this being Pride Month and why we celebrate. Um, you know, when I was asked to be here with all of you amazing people, I uh, the first thing that went into my mind is that I stand on the shoulders of our queer ancestors. And I think about the people who came before me, that came before us. I think about Lorraine Hansberry and Nikki Giovanni and Barbara Jordan and uh, Byron Rustin and James Baldwin. And um, something that comes to mind historically is Lucy Hicks Anderson. This was a woman who lived 68 years authentically. She was the first black trans woman to fight for marriage equality. She was born in 1886 and she died in 1954. And we all know that there's been queer people in this world as long as there's been people. And some people, um, I'll listen to them and it all happened in 1969 and at Stonewall and they feel like that was a parade. Well, that was not a parade, that was a riot. And so, when I think about 1969 and I take it back a little farther and Daniel was talking about um, books and things like that and magazines that women created. And I remember this magazine in the fifties, it was called The Ladder. And that was a women's magazine, a lesbian magazine and the guys had one. And that was the gay magazine and how um, people had to go out of our way to connect and find community. And once we found community, it was just on. And I think that's why we have such great parties and great celebrations because we find our people. And when we find our people, many times those people become our families. And when I think back to my family, I heard Robert talk a little bit about his history and where he came from and where his family came from. My family was part of the great Negro migration. My great grandmother put my grandmother, my mother who was then three years old and uh, my great aunts and my one great uncle and they all got in the truck and in two cars and came from Texas to California. And that's where we landed and that's where we stayed until my partner and I came here to Oregon almost 15 years ago. And when we came here, it was interesting because I knew we were here. I too had heard about um, the death of the two women that Elliot touched on and about how these two women did so much to the community in Medford and Ashland 
to help uh, form community. And from their loss and their deaths, I believe Lotus Rising Project uh, became a program and connected the youth. And something that I feel we are resilient. We are a resilient community and we are resilient people. And in coming here, um, I thought to myself, where is our celebration? Where is our pride parade? I think back um, in, 19, in 1969, there was the Stonewall riot, but in 1966, there was a riot at Compton's Cafe where our transgendered sisters and gay men uh, had a riot for our rights and they stood up for social inequities that were happening then that continue to happen now. And for me, I believe that's why it's so important for us to be able to come together and celebrate once a, once a year, whatever it is. And I know that uh, Southern Oregon Pride um, has the parade in October because it's National Coming Out Month. And it's an opportunity for all of us to get together and celebrate our similarities and not our differences because we are so much more similar than we are different. And this is our community and our families that we form. So I just thinking about historically where we came from and where we wanna go so that one day we won't have to have the term coming out. It's acceptance, it's not tolerance, it's love and it's not hate because that can take us such a far distance. And with that, Elliot, I will shut it down and close so Delane can speak and then we'll open it up and we'll have that celebration that I talked about. Thank you. Okay, Gina, okay. thank you. Oh my gosh, so much more I wanna hear. Um, and yeah, we'll pass it to you, Delane. Thanks. Um, thanks, Gina, it's nice to see you again. Um, so I'm uh, helping fill in um, some of the, uh, basically the community center kind of um, piece of the history in Southern Oregon. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, clarifying the Abdel Ellis piece a little bit. So Roxanne Ellis and Michelle Abdel were the couple uh, that lived in Medford. They were uh, murdered in 1990, I believe, and out of that came the Abdel Ellis Lambda Community Center, which was in Ashland. Um, and when I moved to the Valley in 1999, that was the place to go. That was the hub for queer community. Um, where Lotus Rising Project comes in, which is the organization that I um, co-founded with a, a group of pretty powerful youth. Um, in the early 2000s, I think, I, I neglected to look up the, the official um, historical presentation that has all the official dates, but um, uh, where Lotus Rising Project came from was really a very grassroots small group of youth, uh, youth age like 14 to 25, which speaks a little bit to um, the process of coming out um, at the time. I think it's um, becoming, I hope, becoming more integrated so that queer people can um, develop in adolescence when they're adolescents. <laughs> and and um, so youth can be youth, uh, teenage years can be teenage years and young adult years can be young adult years. Um, so uh, the Abdel Ellis Center was having some difficulties and um, uh, starting to come to a close. I volunteered there, um, stepped in uh, when there was no nobody to um, support and hold space for the youth group that they had uh, going on, which was mostly kind of a social thing. And um, 
And that became Not Straight, Not Sure. So when Abdul Ellis Center closed, those youth came to me and they said, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? And I said, what do you wanna do? And they said, we still wanna meet. And I said, okay. So saying yes gets me into a lot of um, work <laughs> and, and, and uh, adventures. And this one certainly did. So, uh, so that group really, and this was one of the, in the questions that you gave us to think about Elliot, um, this is really one of the, the things um, that I'd like people to remember about Lotus Rising Project and take it into whatever the current work is and in the future is that we had such a wonderful relationship um, that respected the intergenerational nature of who was at the table and allowed the youth at the table to really guide um, where they wanted to go. And then the adults supported whatever that was um, and helped teach and mentor and you know, work side by side. So those youth also uh, with so much wisdom looked at their own experience with under the Abdul Ellis umbrella at the time and made some really conscious decisions about how they wanted to organize and how they wanted to interact with each other and um, you know, if they were gonna have a board of directors, like how would that, that group function? Who would be on that group? So there was very conscious decision-making and putting into place uh, ways to communicate with each other, concordant decision-making model, um, doing what a lot of boards of nonprofits um, in my observation, uh, miss out on is retreats together and learning together, learning about leadership, learning how to facilitate meetings together um, that are inclusive, that really make sure that every single person um, who wants to be there, who knows and cares about whatever the topic is that's being discussed, um, and that there's a way to facilitate that so that the ideas are captured, that there's a lot of creativity, and that everybody's voice gets heard at the table or in the room. So that was one of the things that I wanted to um, highlight as something that the youth of Not Straight, Not Sure, which is called NSNS, did as they created Lotus Rising Project. Um, so some of my favorite highlights from uh, NSNS slash Lotus Rising Project times uh, one, some of you may have been in attendance at an all ages prom at some point in the 2000s, early 2000s. The first one was in 2006 and it was um, really spearheaded by uh, one of the youth who later came back and was the executive director of Lotus Rising Project, which is another wonderful, um, I think evidence of, of that um, inclusivity and mentoring um, kind of culture that they uh, cultivated. Uh, so Mario Fragoso uh, put together the first prom and it was titled Brokeback Prom and it was fantastic. And there were, there, the age ranges at that prom were from like about a three or four year old to somebody in their eighties. And I think the person who won the belt buckle contest was in their seventies or eighties. <laughs> so, which yes, Gina involved, it was a good party and it did involve some, some good dancing to win that belt buckle contest. So that was one of the really unique things about Lotus Rising Project was really bringing um, generational wisdom together. Um, let's see, there was a film festival uh, one year that was fantastic. It was at the public library. And that's also one of the things that I think Lotus Rising Project really, and actually the, the youth early and Not Straight Not Sure actually started this before there was a Lotus Rising Project, was to have um, guest nights that were open to the public. So serving the greater community, um, being seen in a greater context, not just sort of like pigeonholed on the side over there <laughs> with a secret meeting, but really um, 
providing some reciprocity in the community. So that was a regular part of it. And the film festival one year was just kind of like a huge um, splash of that kind of thing. And it was held at the Medford Public Library. So it was open to anyone to come. And the films were great. Um, there was a lot of grant writing involved in that. So that was a highlight definitely for me. I would say the, um, the youth um, really uh, letting them follow their nose and, and seek out um, identifying a problem that they experienced and then offering a way to support them to create a solution. So one of the programs of Lotus Uh, who was local, who grew up uh, in the valley and had a really difficult experience at Grants Pass High School. And that youth asked, you know, I want to do something about this issue, about my experience in high school. I want to help that not happen in the future. So I went with them and we made an appointment to go talk to the counselors at Grants Pass High School. That was a huge facing fear moment for that youth to walk into that school and let those counselors know what their experience was and what he was doing to offer something different to those students um, and saying, hey, this is, this is now here. We have a group that can support those students. Um, so that kind of development of, of programming, um, I think it was also, a piece of local history uh, that Lotus Rising Project helped out with that didn't start with Lotus Rising Project was the um, teen theater project that I believe started actually at Central Point High School and went to Planned Parenthood at some point. And then there was a crisis and Lotus Rising Project um, had somebody, it was actually Matthew Reynolds who's really passionate about it, went to Planned Parenthood and say, hey, we don't want this to die how can we help? So that's how the teen theater program uh, or social justice theater, I think is what it, it, things change names throughout the years, which is a good thing, but then it makes it hard for me to remember what they, <laughs> what they were most recently called. Um, let's see, something else that I really, as I was looking at the reflection questions, um, favorite memories actually those really, really early days before there was a Lotus Rising project when there was a little group of five to eight um, youth who had almost all experienced some kind of homelessness and all the trials and tribulations that uh, tend to go with being a, having the queer youth experience at that time. Um, meetings at my house when we couldn't find another place to meet. We got kicked out of like three different places um, you know, we went through all of that and just the sweet, intimate meetings in my living room um, or, you know, <laughs> one time, uh, so youth went to the like food something, food pantry, and they brought to the meeting tofu and said, teach us how to cook tofu so that we spent the whole meeting in the kitchen, um, me teaching them what to do with tofu. So there's just like so many sweet um really uh, community moments with each other, just being with each other. Um, some of the things that were that feel like unfinished work from Lotus Rising Project, um, one for me is a mentor program that's, that has some, a little bit of structure to it so that youth and elders can um, ha have a way to spend time with each other one-on-one -on -one or in, in groups. Um, that's something that happened a little bit naturally, but there, there, were, there was uh, often discussion about how can we formalize that a little bit so that um, when a youth you know, shows up that maybe that is uh, something that fits better for them than a, bit, than a large group meeting or than going to prom or something like they, they would really like you know, to be taken out to lunch once a month by somebody who's just their, their person. And, um, and I feel like uh, things like that are also um, part of teaching each other our queer history and our queer culture. 
um, because that you know gets left out of of mainstream history a lot. So that's a way to do that. Um, I would like um, to see in movement forward and movements forward the spirit of Lotus Rising Project, those conscious agreements and ways that the youth really worked to create a culture where discussions and integration um, and creativity are, are really valued and that there are ways to have a meeting together that really foster that in a safe way. Um, and so uh, a way to have awareness around the blame or the right or wrong or the differences between um, an attack and an invitation to a conversation and to um, create ways to really recognize that there's wisdom in each person's place in the circle and that um, to help each other step out of the stories that limit the ultimate good that can be created uh, when we you know, put our creative juices together. And so uh, that might sound like, you know, from the context of Lotus Rising Project and our focus on the intergenerational piece was um, you know, a story like, well, young people, whatever. And then that just like automatically limits the wisdom that might come from that person seen as young and foolish or doesn't know anything, whatever it is, you can fill in the blank. Um, and then on the opposite, you know, old people X. Um, so supporting each other to um, face those stories and check them out and loosen those structures, those defensive structures with each other and actually consciously um, adopt ways to communicate with each other in groups that foster that kind of environment. Um, so that's, I think that's what I got. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. Um, I'm floored over here. I've got so many questions. I'm like so, so grateful. Um, and so I think this seems like a good time to take a five minute break. Yeah. So let's take a five minute break and then uh, we'll come back. We'll, we'll be in gallery view. We'll open up the chat and there will be some opportunity to have a little more discussion. Um, yeah. Okay, so see you back here at 718.
Lucy. Hi. Um, we're gonna bring it back, or you're you're invited back. If you want to turn on your camera, uh, that would be great. If you don't, that's also totally fine. And uh, I'd invite you if you want to to at the in the top right where you can do view, you can put it in gallery view. And if nobody does that, it's also okay. Hi, Rory. Um, the chat is open and uh, yeah, so we wanted to make a little space just to uh, hear from people that was phenomenal. And I'm, yeah, again, really honored. And I guess I, uh, yeah, I'm putting this in the context that we did this big survey last year where a lot of people said there is no LGBTQ history, there's no LGBTQ community here. It's hard to find, it's scattered, it doesn't exist. You know, so, and um, this is a testament to the opposite. Um, yeah, so we won't talk about all the questions that people have probably, uh, but we do have some time. So if you have a question, you could drop it in the chat. Um, and maybe that's a good way and yeah. Um, Or Robert, Delane, Gina, Daniel, do you have any questions for each other? Uh, well, I just, Robert, on the I break, see. I thought of like other highlights of Lotus Rising Project years and NSNS years. And one of them is, you know, Gina came in and dovetailed in there somewhere where um, pride was, was um, a little shaky in the in the valley and it had been at times like a really huge thing we used to have it out at the fairgrounds um a long time ago and um so it was great you know gina came in with her energy and organization skills and brought people together to continue that and so one of my uh favorites uh was that uh lotus rising project had the wedding float uh <laughs> before the uh, when all when it was all the buzz of like we want the right to to uh, have marriage and that was such a great experience. Um, it was built in my driveway. You know, it was just good crazy. <laughs> do, you, do you know, Duane? I could so when we took our break, I was going. My head was going too because I remember those early days last year. Um, the day for Pride was going to be 10, 10, 2020. It was so awesome. But then the pandemic came and we were celebrating. It would have been 10 years of since our first parade. So next time it'll be 10 years plus one. But um, something that I remember before we had marriage equality and how we all rallied around together and bitched and signed petitions and said no 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 and I just love the the good old rebellious days but maybe that's the rebellion in me and uh when you were talking about the highlights something that I remember that kind of blew me away you know it was probably like the fourth year of the pride parade and of course the first year of the pride parade was like oh my god it was so cool and that was in 2010 and then the second year yay we're gonna do it again and then when it came around to the fourth year, I thought, wow, we need some publicity. We need to get this going. And we decided to go to the Boat Neck Parade in Grants Pass and they welcomed us, Grants Pass warmly to be a part of their parade. And so we thought, wow, April Pear Blossom is coming. Let's be in the Pear Blossom Parade. And they said, no, they said, no, this is a family parade and we don't want you guys here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, really? We're family. And uh, this no got picked up by Channel 5 just on a fluke because I knew Larry Miller. I love Larry, miss him terribly, used to work there. So it got picked up and then it went like crazy and people were yelling at Pear Blossom Parade. What are you talking about? ACLU was here. NAACP was here, everybody landed on Southern Oregon and they were like, oh, oh yes, yes, we want you. 
and it, it just flipped the script. That was so cool. That was one of the highlights and memorable moments back in the day. Yeah. I also want to just shout out um, P flag has been in this valley is definitely part of the history of this valley and um, was uh, integral support for NSNS youth for a while. It's a great connection. Yes. And actually when I when before I moved to the valley in 1999, that was one of the things we came up for the 4th of July parade. I'd never been here before. And I wasn't so sure this little dinky town in the middle of nowhere, I don't know, is this gonna be okay? Um, and the P flag marched in the 4th of July parade. And I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> I see Xander's question in the chat. And Robert, I saw your hand earlier. Do you wanna speak? Yeah, um, during my time earlier, I meant to mention that one of the best books I've ever read on two-spirit identity is written by a man named Walter Williams, and it's called The Spirit and the Flesh, Sexual Diversity in Native America, or something like that is kind of the uh, undertitle. But um, Walter Williams is the author, and um, I don't think he's Native. I think he's a gay man who traveled around to various tribal communities and uh, stayed with two-spirit, mostly male-bodied two-spirit uh, um, tribal members and got their take on the history and what their role in con their contemporary tribal community was. And, and um, so it, it's, to me, it's the best thing I've read that's uh, been written about the subject. And, you know, what you're saying about those little signals like uh, seeing the P flag in the parade, um, we, all, we all need those signals to feel safe in our communities or um, wherever we're traveling about, those rainbow flags in the windows of stores or, or in people's lawns, all of those things are signs of being welcome and open and inclusive, so. important to continue that. Um, I would like to identify Major Lack in response to your question of uh, archive capacities within intentional communities. Uh, they tend to have such high turnover even where they're stable. Um, and definitely a downside of communal living is often if it's visible, it's communal. And if it's communal, I can take it. Um, there is something that passes for a library at the Nomina Sanctuary, and it's basically full of crap because people leave books there, other people take the good books. What you see there is a collection of the stuff nobody wanted. Um, but where to park archival materials is a major problem. Um, the question comes up occasionally, and people get pointed to San Francisco or Portland or Seattle. Um, I will say the University of Oregon has an extensive collection. Um, because I, I think because of Gene, it might've been Ruth Mountain Grove, uh, but a major tranche of archival materials there called SOCLAP, the Southern Oregon Country Lesbian Archives Project. I think, I haven't looked it up, but I think that's right. Um, and there are issues with accessing it. Some people's materials in there, the donors don't want that stuff accessible to men. Um, mm. And those are the kind of problems that come up when you rely on an external institution to be the repository of your own, like basically primary source material documentation. On the other hand, if you don't have very stable infrastructure because you're countercultural and everything's pretty hand to mouth, then just hanging on to it doesn't really work either. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, uh, speaking more strictly in the men's community tradition, there are factors uh, within the institution that don't want to remember. Um, sometimes a, a short or narrow or shallow history pull is useful to certain kinds of leadership styles. 
let's put it that way. Um, but it brings up the question, like, where does our history go and who owns it and controls it after we've produced it or are done with it? And uh, it may be something worth looking at, like regionally for all of our diverse communities, like a queer archives in and of and for Southern Oregon. Um, I don't have the answer to that. I've asked the question a couple of times and it's so much running around. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I can't step in and solve it, but uh, it's a recurrent problem and could definitely use some attention. Mm -hmm. Another piece of the history here is the development of the QRC at SOU, which um, I was, um, man, I was so pregnant at the time. I was asked to be on the hiring panel for the first director of the QRC at SOU and like barely made it <laughs> through that process. <laughs> but it's another thread, right, is the um, university campuses and what happens there. I think that might be a future, like maybe that's a future focus just on that because I know there's a lot of stories I don't know there. Um, Daniel, I think, was responding to Xander's question, but maybe I'll just say it out loud also, and, and if anyone else wants to speak to it. Um, Xander asked, how would you want to carry this knowledge out into the world and the larger community? How can we keep this knowledge from disappearing once again? Well, Elliot, I... I think carrying the message is doing what you're doing right now. Carrying the message, I heard you say that you wanted to do this again in August um, because the more that we connect, we know there is a message. And by each one of us leaving this space and telling a friend, wow, did you know this? Did you know about this? I mean, when I got here and I heard about um, the two women who were killed, it just blew me away. Not here, you know, and so, and the, and the reason why, you know, straight up hate crime and to be able to hear Robert and Danielle and Delane's stories and, um, and to just connect. So this is the beginning of what you are doing right now is carrying it and how we can hold it is to be able to, um, I'm sure that we can manifest an opportunity to house it through books, through video, through um, storytelling. And that's how we house it and that's how we carry it on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think in all communities there are, um, youth activities, there are youth programs, and there's oftentimes pushback to having anything around identity or whether it's gender or sexuality um, issues move into those spaces. But here in tribal communities, we have a um, much more of a free ability to introduce those subjects and talk about them uh, and just introducing the subject by somebody who's comfortable with the subject is so powerful to young people to even hear it talked about because otherwise a lot of times it's just considered a taboo subject and they're wrestling with those issues or have questions themselves and and so um you know here in the tribal communities we have that history we need to pass it along keep our young people safe and comfortable in their own skin and um, so it's a, a duty that we've taken on. And actually some of our work here within our tribal administration um, happened through a Western State Center um, grant to our tribe to review all of our policies, ordinances, codes, because we are a tribal government. Uh, we have all of those different um, kind of policy pieces and to review them, make sure that they were all open, inclusive to all of our types of families and definition of family and spouse, all of that was open, inclusive and consistent. And uh, what we arrived at was that 
most of those things were already open and inclusive, but we just needed to have the consistency of language adjusted a little bit. And at the end of that process, then the team that put together um, all of that work uh, made the request that we didn't have a marriage ordinance within our tribe and ask for a uh, marriage ordinance to be developed and that it be uh, inclusive of same-sex couples. And so that was kind of the final piece of that work. I just wanna say hi, everybody. Um, I know I've met Elliot and Sophie very briefly, but uh, I'm new to the Rogue Valley. My name is Raven. Um, I'm from Southern California originally where I've been a trans youth mentor for many, many years. Um, I myself, um, I worked through a trans empowerment project in Los Angeles. I tried to bring a chapter of that up here when I moved up here three years ago, but uh, the organization itself has kind of fallen apart as far as their structure wise. So I have a hard time getting things to move forward <clears throat> with them. So um, I'm a two spirit from Cherokee uh, tribe. Um, I moved here three years ago. Like I said, I retired and kind of left my day job and all that behind to move here and to try to create tribe, create, create tr community, and uh, to try to make a difference for the queer community and the trans community here in Southern Oregon. Uh, so I've had my hand in a lot of cookie jars <laughs> with a lot of like big plans that a lot of the people here that I know really want to like bring to fruition. And I know business owners here in Ashland that want to start having queer events. They want to start having trans specific, providing trans and queer specific safe spaces for us to be gathering and coming out, especially the youth um, and, and holding these spaces for our community, for, for our youth to grow up in, in a community that knows that this community supports them and that, and that they can be safe to be themselves. And, and I think Elliot, like one of the things you said, what your question was, how can we make this, keep this going? And a part of it for me is once I found my awakening and my path in life and my purpose, my purpose is essentially to tell my story. And the more I am open with my life and completely transparent and completely vulnerable, and I go around telling my story, not only as a queer homeless youth, but being on the trans spectrum as a two-spirit now. And, and I've lived through so much trauma in my lifetime. And so I reach out and I touch a very, a lot of different people in a lot of different manners because I'm a, I'm an injured veteran. I was a US veteran in the military, injured during the Iraq war. You know, so a lot of, I have a lot of, a lot of trauma and a lot of history. And so when I reach out and do my mentoring, it's just about telling your story and you never know how many people you're gonna touch. And I've met a few gurus that I've talked to that said like, yes, keep this going, keep telling your story, keep trying to help your community, just keep being yourself and keep being transparent and open and vulnerable with people. And that's the absolute best thing that we can be doing for our community. Because not only are we educating others by showing how comfortable we are in our own skin, but the more comfortable we are in our own skin and we show that to everybody else, the more people, the more other people feel comfortable with themselves and with us. And I've really, I've really seen that more so any time in my life, and I'm 48, but, but in, in the past three years that I've been living here in Southern Oregon, I made a conscious decision to move here and live very out loud and, and very, very presently out loud at all times. And there have been moments in Southern Oregon and in spaces where I've felt fear for my life, <laughs> for sure. Um, and I'm learning like all the ins and outs of all the new places and spaces, but the one consensus thing I've gotten in, in general from all of the community and all of the Applegate and Ashland and Medford and Grants Pass is that everybody wants to come together. Everybody wants to form community. They want to keep our history alive. They want to keep continuing to show our pride. And so I have partnered with a business owner in Ashland and we're looking at hopefully as soon as these COVID restrictions really start getting lifted at opening some sort of queer cafe kind of bar in Ashland so that the young people can meet there and older people can meet there. And it's a very open, comfortable, safe environment for them. And I just really wanna put it out to all y'all because I know you've been here in this area much longer than I have, but like I'm retired now 
And other than theater acting, I have all the time in the world to dedicate to really want to make a change for our community. And so I would love anybody's input or reach out to me or anything as long if I can be involved and help y'all with anything or whatever you may need. I've been a, I've been a nurse for 25 years. I'm a Le Cordon Bleu chef. I'm a yogi. I'm a healer. Um, I'm an empath. And so my my biggest my biggest draw now in this life is to take who I am and and to really help other kids and other other humans and adults like us um, to really find that comfort in their skin, to really find that that peace and that and that strength within themselves because we all have it. We just all have to be able to be given that space to be able to like connect with it and find it. And so I'm really happy to meet y'all and. Thank you for hearing me. <laughs> so glad you're here, Raven. Um, I see some really good questions in the chat. I guess I also like hearing you, Raven, and I resonated with a lot of the things that you're saying. Um, just as a person, you know, a person, a trans person, a queer person trying to like build community, make it better for those who are coming after me, learn from those who are coming before me, exactly. um, knowing there's a lot of challenges in this region. And I guess I, I mean, this, in some ways, this panel is very selfishly put together, which is like, <laughs> I'm curious, you know, Robert, Daniel, Delane, Gina, like for, for, for us who are, you know, as wanting and doing it, you know, to build queer community, to imagine a stronger LGBTQIA2+, like, um, yeah, like movement and community in this region. Like, do you have any advice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, um, probably not allowed anymore to do some of the things that I facilitated back in the day. Um, I was just remembering a truckload of youth off we went to San Francisco to, you know, like, get them out of the valley, see what else exists, have another experience. Um, but I, so advice, I don't know, I probably do, but, but what comes to mind is resources that I have um, to share. Um, so people who are picking up some of these batons, <clears throat> I have what I have from Lotus Rising Project infrastructure and agreements and trainings and, and you know, whatever I have, I'm, I'm glad to share. So um, I would love to um, be open with those things and have conversations with people so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel at least yes. um and you can pick and choose from what you know you feel like worked or what you want to reestablish or what you want to do in a new way um and then the other resource that i have at the moment is um i have said i would never start another nonprofit, but here i am um Recreate, Recrear uh, is, a, is an open community art studio that um, came out of the Alameda fire and the Oberchain fire. Um, and now, right now uh, has a, a summer hybrid. So people could join by Zoom wherever they are, or people can come to Ashland and be in the space um, to, for a couple hours at a time um, to make art and have community. Um, and the, the little board, I've already talked to the, <clears throat> the board. And um, so one of the ways that we would like to be able to offer that space is for, um, you know, microcultures to have a safe space, just to come use the space, make stuff, Beautiful. talk, plan the revolution, whatever you want to do. <laughs> right? so, so that's kind of like, that's where my focus is right now. And then I also have um, uh, built a private practice, uh, people's art. And we serve a lot of, I think we're kind of the go-to now in the medical community for anyone who has questions about their gender identity. Mm. Um, so we're here. Um, um, 
and you, you know if somebody has an idea about using our resources then I do a lot of, I actually do a lot of counseling for people who are questioning their gender, questioning their sexuality, mm -hmm. all the things. I just, people tend to flock to me for some reason. Um, and that's why my spirit name's always been the spirit of the raven is because like when people are ready for change, they just seem to drop into my life. And next thing you know, I have 10 people going, can I ask you a question? You know, and that always leads into the gender identity, the sexuality. And all the things and so i'd love to be able to point people in a direction yeah if anyone if, if you come across anyone who is in need of um you know specific counseling psychotherapy um related to gender sexuality we uh -huh. have three therapists who are incredibly savvy and um nice. so that's a resource perfect thank yeah. you so much yeah i'll be right back y'all <laughs> I hope to be the first one to buy Daniel's book when it comes out because uh, you obviously have a lot of information that needs to be shared. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I've been in the area since the early teens and soliciting elder stories and not everybody wants to speak and not everybody wants to speak on the record. And that's an interesting mix of issues. Some of it is uh, people worry about loss of narrative control. You know, if somebody goes and writes up my story, it's no longer mine. Um, some of it is political. There are elders who tell the same story different ways to different people or different ways to the same people um, as part of a sort of social engineering. I'm trying, you know, I'm not trying to put a judgment on that. It's just like their way in the world, but it is kind of a part of their superpowers. And who are we to ask them to relinquish that? Um, my main uh, advice and a common thread I've seen in what everybody, all, all the speakers have talked about is uh, I think that post-modernity has given us the rise of an identity politics that resonates very deeply with people who are new in the coming out or maybe more to the point coming to themselves process, uh, discovering that you're not normal and deciding, well, who are you? And then finding other people who can help you with that and affirm that externally is all very important. But I've seen in my own community that taking to an extreme where a kind of identity politics emerges within communities that becomes a kind of identity warfare. Um, people get so entrenched in their particular intersection and uh, demanding that people immediately around them right the wrongs of injustice that they've experienced that I think the question becomes, okay, you all have your intersections, but where are your town squares? Where are your piazzas? You know, the Italians live their lives outside in public and there's also a private interior life, but whole families and whole political parties do all these open outdoor living like in the town piazza, because that is the space where everybody congregates. Um, and I see everybody here is sort of address that. And it brings me back to, you know, some of what I see in Carl Whitman's work about how it's important to have our own spaces to build and defend ourselves. But it's also super important to come together and realize that we're all part of a bigger community and we're all part of a bigger common cause, that we are each other's friends and allies. And I know that those terms have been politicized and used, but take them back down to their basics. When push comes to shove, who's standing with you? And look around and reach out to those people where it's appropriate to do so. It's easy to lose that these days, I think. Um, Sophie's got some great questions in the chat <laughs> um you want to read read one out or read them both out yeah uh, yeah sure um so given that marginalized communities in this region are at diverse levels of undergroundness for safety reasons um yet that obscurity feels like it distances groups and people from the advocacy work and resources we might need. Uh, one question is, 
How have you towed that line of remaining safe whilst navigating visibility as queer figures in the community through these moments of history? And have you felt uh, remorse about the distance between queer communities and queer people from the resources meant to serve them? Um, one of the things that comes to mind since my um, time has mostly been with youth um, and, and so it goes for myself as well, is really navigating the balance between the desire to um, have complete freedom of expression <laughs> and, um, and, and to navigate that um, safely. So um, I haven't, I don't know about you all, I, I, I'm not, not anything super terrible is coming to my mind for myself personally, um, although I have experienced it. So from my perspective uh, historically has more been on the behalf of youth and um, so create, you know, how to do that um, when the risk is so high for somebody who's still living at home um, and there's such a strong desire to just be exactly who I feel I am. <laughs> so, you know, part of that is definitely um, creating space, um, creating spaces and times where that is okay, um, where that is welcomed. Prom was definitely one of those things and just the regular meeting um, for youth was a place where that was okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I have felt actually a lot of remorse about um, distance between queer community and queer people from the resources meant to serve them. Um, I think, um, you know, um, Daniel speaking to that a little bit about the intersections and the culture within culture and the microcultures and it's part of what I speak to when I say, you know, hold each other uh, compassionately accountable for the stories that we're telling ourselves and that we're, we're acting out of um, and check those to see if I can um, listen better um, and be listened to. So I have experienced in this community in the past um, quite a bit of intense um, backlash and um, prejudice and um, yeah, hurtful interactions with um, organizations at different times in the history and groups um, suspect of what I was doing with a lot of prejudice about mm -hmm. who they perceived me to be personally. Mm -hmm. So that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> it's a tender subject still. <laughs> And I've learned a ton you know, from David and Robert, especially. You know, I, I would like to uh, kind of jump on that too, is um, how do we find a safe place? And if, if you are a marginalized person and uh, here in Southern Oregon, I have experienced Something that I want is I want to put it out to the youth and say that you know we we spoke about history. I heard a lot about history this evening, and I appreciate that because our history, you know, we know who we are because of the shoulders that we stand on. And so, in moving forward and creating that safe space, not only for yourselves but for the people who will be in front of you, is to truly live out loud to be able to um, hold people accountable and to be able, and what I mean by that and living out loud is put your head up and be who you are and live your authentic life. And don't let anybody take your joy or take away who you are or allow you an opportunity to not trust yourself. Because if they point one finger at you, three fingers are pointing back at them. So you put your head up high and you go out there and live your life 
And one thing that I feel, and I'll say this quickly, is that um, to be able to hold people accountable and to be seen and to be out there, educate yourselves, run for office, be visible. You make the laws, you make the policies, you write the legislature, you make it right, not only for you, but the people who are coming in front of you. And you can do this. I have all faith in you. This is only the beginning. You are making history. As we're moving towards closing, I wonder like Daniel, Robert, if you wanna you know, either answer the question or just any last things you wanna say. Yeah. Go for it, Robert. Yeah, um, I don't know if I've been lucky or unlucky in life. I'm about six foot four and now 300 pounds. So um, not very often do I uh, run into somebody who's wanting to take that on. <laughs> um, but I had an interesting experience. You know, I, I, um, I, I think of myself as pretty visible uh, as an out gay man. And um, so I, on my way back from Southern Oregon coast yesterday, I had an experience I haven't had very often and not in a very long time. Um, I'd gone into the Moe's restaurant in Florence and had to get on a waiting list. As I was exiting, I held the door for um, two teenage couples, two boys and two girls. And um, they, none of them were wearing masks. They were asked to leave and kind of left angrily. So I was walking up the plank walk towards my truck to um, wait for my signal to come in. And they were leaving angrily. And I heard one of the boys say, did you see that faggot? And I turned my head and all four of them are looking at me. And then they quickly turn their heads. And I, I'm like, and one of them kind of smirked when they saw it kind of like turned as turning away, like I wasn't gonna do anything about it. And I'm like, the hell with that. I'm gonna go confront them. So I did. And they were mouthy little twerps the whole time, didn't apologize. But I just thought it was important to call them out on their behavior. And it was, um, I think I would have felt much worse, even as I, I'm not a confrontational person, really. I think I would have felt much worse if I had just let it go. But, you know, being 6'4 and 300 pounds, I'm, I feel like I'm not um, going to be threatened by even a pack of teenagers. Um, and it's part of my peace of mind to stand up for myself. And all of us have different ability to do that. And there's different situations where you may not be safe in doing that. Um, so stay safe in doing it. But for me, at least it works to, for my peace of mind to stand up for myself and not just let that stuff slide by. But it was a, the first experience like that in a very long time. Yeah, I want to echo that. And I think that, um, it, you know, it's not for everybody, but where and as you can, I think that, 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 well, Harvey Milk said that the single most important thing you can do for gay rights, and he was speaking in the 1970s, so that people still talk like that, uh, was come out because people can hate an abstraction so easily. And it becomes much harder when it's your friend, your family, your loved one, your teacher, your coach, somebody that you know and respect. And then the anti-queer propaganda stops working and somebody starts painting us as a monster, more people know differently. And that's not really something youth is particularly well positioned to do because young people are still coming into themselves. But as you get older, um, and you build up the kinds of social capital and resources that give you some security in society, even with people who don't like you, um, being out and visible and working with the muggles changes their mentality in a way that makes it possible for our people to survive in more places under more conditions. And I don't know how well our community supports that or doesn't support that. I'm not 
trying to weigh in with an opinion on it. I do know that I feel like I do a lot more for us working at Rogue Community College than I do at the Wolf Creek Radical Ferry Sanctuary, for example. Um, and other people's mileage may vary, um, but it's just something to think about, like how do we make friends with muggles? What work do we do in the straight world that makes it more possible for us as a fabulous diversity of people to not just exist in tolerance, but thrive as active and recognized parts of vital parts of our communities. Thanks, Daniel. And thank you so much, Delane and Gina and Robert. Um, Oh my gosh, I could keep talking with you all all night. And I hope this is that there's more and more and more like this. Um, I am so grateful. Yeah, I'm so grateful for your coming and your sharing and making the space to ask a lot more questions. And I feel really blessed. Um, yeah, so uh, here we are. Um, I'm, I'm here part of the, you know, this event is part of the Rogue Action Center's LGBTQ plus listening project, um, which is aspiring to build a stronger LGBTQ plus movement in our region that is informed by our history and supporting each other. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have, if you wanna get involved in what we're doing, if you have ideas for future things like this, or you wanna keep talking, um, yeah, and thanks you all for coming. Uh, next week on Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m., we're hosting a trans and queer know your rights uh, training on Zoom. It, we're co-hosting it with So Equity and the Jackson County Library and the Josephine County Social Justice Alliance. So, um, yeah, and it's focused on, you know, uh, our rights in public space and healthcare and educational settings to even start to feel outraged that they're being violated. So, um, so please come or, you know, and, and, and tell folks, especially if they're positioned to support other queer people in their lives. Um, yeah, and if you, I'm gonna drop in the chat, um, there's a link to register for that and that we have a little form for like feedback about this event um and my email address is there if you if you want to reach out or you want to help make this happen again and um yeah that's it thank you <laughs> thank you thank Elliot. You. thanks everyone thanks Elliot. Oh my gosh, and I forgot to say, Kaylee, thank you so much for doing the tech. Oh my gosh, I wrote it at the top of my things to say. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was my what pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much. That felt really smooth and I'm really grateful. I'm glad. Yeah, it all went very well. I am it was awesome. Cool. We could probably stop recording now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, stop recording. Hi to the future.